welcome to the Citizens Report for the 6th of August 2021. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party Research Director Robert Barwick. Welcome. Thanks, Elisa. And on today's show, the Super Swindle Exposed, where we're going to talk about the rort that is a major feature of our superannuation system. And secondly, the foreign interference scandal nobody's talking about. And we're going to discuss how Australia has buckled to pressure from two foreign governments to put up a law that will jeopardise our international diplomacy and relations. Now, before we get started, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you're alerted of new shows uh, and also share it, this information as widely as possible. And if they want more information on what we talk about, you click on the I in the corner of the screen. Yes, so now on to the first topic, the super swindle exposed. Uh, but first we have a couple of updates on ongoing campaigns, starting with Australia Post, where it was reported this week that Christine Holgate reached a settlement with Australia Post in which they will pay her $1 million uh, essentially as a termination payment. But however, they have not admitted any wrongdoing in this case. Yeah, so... Uh, this ends it for Christine Holgate, and I did tweet about that. I think I think um, uh, it's a great loss to Australians that, um, that now this is over, people should take stock. It is a great loss. I compared her to uh, our greatest ever public servants, and by that by that I mean great Australians who gave a lot to public service in crucial times in our history. And I mentioned Denison Miller, the the, the founding governor of the, of the Commonwealth Bank. Dr. JJC Bradfield, who built, who built the um, Sydney Harbour Bridge and Sydney subway system and designed the Bradfield scheme we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and Essington Lewis, the great BHP boss who stepped in to run Australia's World War II mobilisation. Um, Christine Holgate isn't as well known as them but uh, in terms of history yet, but what she did for the time she was at Australia Post was brilliant. Now, Elisa, it's just, it's got ridiculous though, right, because... Um, uh, first of all, yeah, the government's not, and Australia Post is not admitting liability. Ignore the million dollars. Um, it's, she's not run away with a million dollars, right? This is what she was owed under her contract. That's all it is. Uh, compare it to her predecessor who left with $10 million. Mm -hmm. that, that, she is not in it for the money. It was never about the money with her, right? And the proof that the watches was not a rort. The Cartier watches they made such a big deal about is what's in today's press, where because she's now um, going to be running a company, Global Express, that's somewhat of a rival to Australia Post, Australia Post is losing executives who are following her out the door. Mm. And in order to stop that, they are apparently paying retention bonuses to try and keep those executives around. Retention bonuses. Mm. Now, remember, the chair of Australia Post sat there in the hearing and said he would never... He wasn't the chair at the time, remember... So he was talking after the fact. I would never have approved those watches. That's what he said in that hearing because that was part of throwing her under the bus. These were $5,000 watches. Mm. And as I've said in the show before, a real Cartier watch is 500000 These were cheap trinkets by comparison, to be honest. It was just an acknowledgement of the work these executives had done. He said he would never have approved that. Well, he has approved paying up to $250,000 in bonuses to keep these people from following Christine Holgate out the door. And many of them already have followed her and out the door. That, Eight executives, I think. That's the one, those are the ones he hasn't been able to stop. Mm. Now, he's approved it. It means the Minister Fletcher knows and the Prime Minister knows. She can go, the Prime Minister knows, over $5,000. This was, they're rubbing your face in it, people. We knew, at the minute we heard the other side of the story, the Licensed Post Office Group and Australia, Christine Holgate side of the story, we knew this was such a disgusting twisting of the facts and, a, and, a, and, a, and an invented scandal thanks to Kimberly Kitching and Scott Morrison, a Labor member, a Labor senator and a, and a creepy, disgusting Prime Minister. Right? They invented the scandal and nothing to drive away the woman who saved Australia Post from bankers and privatisers. We knew that at the time. That's why we fought on this so hard. And now, yes, you know, good for Christine that she doesn't have to deal with these cretins anymore, mm. right? but now they're rubbing their face in it. We do have to follow this up. Um, Elise, and we'll keep, we'll keep updating people on this. Because the government has not actually responded to the findings of this committee inquiry. They're going to try and ignore the committee, right? And we have to make sure that doesn't happen. And specifically, we have to make sure that Morrison is forced to apologise 
Um, and there is an in ongoing inquiry into the chairman, Lucio, into whether he misled the parliament and in the minister, Paul Fletcher, into whether he illegally ordered Christine to Holgate to um, stand aside. Now, another aspect, though, the same day the settlement was announced, I got a reply from Australia Post um, knocking back my freedom of information request. And I had asked, because we, we were happy a month or so ago when they announced that the, um, uh, the banks had renewed Bank at Post for 10 years, NAB and CBA for 10 years, but they didn't say the amount. Whereas in 2018, when Christine Holgate got them to pay the amount, it was $20 million, right? It's called the community representation fee. She made a big deal about it. It wasn't secret. She made a huge deal about it. This is what she needed and it's what saved Australia Post. $20 million a year for the banks so that Australia Post offices could serve their customers. So they've, they've announced they're going to renew it again, but they didn't reveal that amount. And I said, well, freedom of information, what was the amount? They knocked me back. Sorry, that's commercial incompetence, right? Well, it was just as commercial three years ago. And they, so this is a cover up by the banks. And the, essentially the word we have on the street is that it's $10 million. That means it's actually not enough money, right? And it puts Bank at Post at risk um, uh, going forward. And it does prove, Elisa, what we've said for a long time now, forget the, the private banks, we need Australia Post to be its own bank. That's yes. the only way to secure it um, permanently going forward. Now, of course, we've got a campaign uh, to introduce legislation which will be done as soon as Bob Catter can get to Canberra. Uh, get around the lockdowns and get there onto the ground and table the Commonwealth Postal Savings Bank bill. Uh, and as our regular viewers will know, we've been campaigning to get a groundswell within local councils across Australia to endorse a resolution calling for that CPSB bill. Now, last week we reported that the Narrabri Shire passed a resolution. Uh, this week we can report that the Banana Shire, which is in around the Rockhampton region yep. of, of Queensland. Billawheel are in those places. Uh, yep, so they have also passed the same resolution. Now, there was excellent coverage, um, and I'm not sure if we showed last week, but the Narrabri Courier actually had some really good coverage on uh, their passage of the bill, so we'll put that up for you to see. But the Rocky Bulletin also ran coverage of uh, the Banana Shire's passage uh, and that's on the Courier Mail's website, so that was really good coverage. They cited councillors and various of their comments regarding the absolute necessity, things like the fact that banks have closed in Theodore, Maura and Baralabar. Some of those towns don't even have ATMs, which, as one councillor pointed out, could be in the post offices. And Elisa, we, we've, lately we've been citing this new online regional um, news service called The Regional by mm. Dale Webster, who has been... Uh, uh, auditing and check and, and finding out where where bank closures have been happening, um, and so she's just got an update now that um, people can go to her website and see it. But basically, she's she's reporting that since twenty the beginning of twenty twenty one, regional Australia has lost ninety five big four bank branches. Mm -hmm. Right, it's just happening um, faster and faster, and it often happens without notice. Mm -hmm. Just pulls the rug out from under these, these communities, and that's why people are getting motivated to get behind this campaign. Mm. The other good thing about the Rocky Bulletin coverage, they said this motion was originally brought to the Council after the Australian Citizens Party approached the Council for support of the Postal Savings Bank. So follow the little I and go to our campaign page where you can get a copy of that resolu resolution. Send it to all your local councillors and ask them to table this. Yeah, get other people that's to do right. the same. The, the, this is in your hands. I mean, this is a popular idea. You just got to you just got to bring it to the attention of your local people. It's right? not hard on, to get their support. Actually, they yeah. they people love this policy, but um, and most parliamentarians like the policy. It's just there's this, you know, the banks are very powerful in Australia and they've, they're controlling the Morrison government um, and a bunch on the other side. We've got to break through that with this grassroots support. Mm. And this is brilliant. If, if we can get most of the councils in Australia to pass this resolution, it'll become overwhelming for yeah. Parliament. And the other big breakthrough this week is the licensed post office group had their meeting and they also endorsed this resolution, they voted on it, and they also resolved to write to every local council in Australia recommending that they take this approach. So that's yep. brilliant. Um, now, one other thing I want to mention is the possibilities that are un unleashed, really, by postal banking and the extension of that of our proposal for a national credit bank. Uh, the kinds of projects that we could be building in Australia 
to restore trust in our government that they actually have an intention to, you know, get people back to work, as they continue to say but never follow up on, with projects like the Bradfield Scheme, and we've just put out an excellent short four-minute video elaborating on what that would do to transform this country. So you can watch that on our YouTube show, and I highly recommend you do. Now, on to the superannuation swindle. Before you go, Lisa, given that was the update before the main story and it's taken that long, it shows you all the things we're up to at the moment. <laughs> yeah, so on to the main story. Um, now, we covered this topic on superannuation some weeks ago where we played a clip of uh, LMP Senator Jared Rennick who raised a critical issue about superannuation which does not get anywhere near enough attention. And I just want to uh, play again a short 30-second uh, clip from that speech. There's this bit of a deal going around with all the investment funds in the world that if you invest in another country, you don't have to pay tax. We've got a classic one here, Section 855 of the 97 Act, that basically says if you're a foreigner and you invest in non-real assets, right, you own less than 10 per cent of it, you don't have to pay capital gains tax on it. Right? Now, that's, an, that's to appease. We have inve foreign investment funds vest here, invest here. Uh, you know, our funds vest overshore and they, uh, offshore. They all give each other tax breaks. And, that, and then basically you've got ba base erosion profit shifting, where all the wealthy fund managers make all the money, pay themselves bonuses because they don't have to pay tax, and the work is the one who has to pay for it. So, Lisa, what Senator Rennick is essentially describing there is what we call financialisation. And this, he's, he's zeroing in on a certain aspect of it in relation to silver, but basically means financialisation is an economy that just punish, passes money back and forth. But the global pension fund system is based on this rort. Mm. And it's a feature of the system where um, these funds are so big and everyone values foreign investment. Oh, it's so important to have foreign investment, right? And we've got $3 trillion in super. We don't need a cent of foreign investment. We could, we could fund ourselves many times over. But, oh, we, we crave foreign investment. So the Canadian pension funds, and you can tell, they, you know, they say, oh, we'll invest in Australia. And our, our, our super funds go invest over there. And both types of investment get a tax break. Yeah. Right? So, and so they're not actually contributing any extra than we could contribute ourselves. But the net effect is they're ripping off the tax, tax man, yeah. which is us. So we elaborate in an article in this week's Australian Alert Service, which you can contact us for a copy of, um, that's called Superannuation is a gold mine for global tax dodgers, that the Income Tax Assessment Act 1997 exempts a foreign resident from capital gains tax yep. under certain conditions. So that's why they're doing this kind of arrangement with the money going back and forth. So what Australia has seen in terms of our super is a flood of money heading offshore. Um, a lot of these large super funds also directly invest in the Caymans Islands, for instance, to dodge tax in that way as well. So there's multiple ways that they're breaching the system. Um, some Australian superannuation funds are now becoming large enough to follow what's become known as the Canadian model of leveraging public money to acquire private assets overseas. So our funds are going overseas looking for investments rather than, say, putting it into something like the Bradfield scheme here. Um, and an article in the Financial Times talked about this, Australia's pension titans set to storm private capital markets uh, where our uh, Aussie super funds are going to looking to invest overseas and in fact there's another article in this Australian Alert Service which talks about how uh, our super funds are being suckered into the US, the, this bipartisan US infrastructure program that's been announced which is pitiful. Pitiful, it's yeah. like a trillion they need, dollars They need something. $8 trillion dollars of infrastructure just to come up on to speed and they're only going to put up a trillion dollars. Um, but th this is partly because our former fi finance or treasure, treasurer Joe Hockey has been uh, over in the United States promoting something he invented in 2014 called asset recycling, where in order to fund infrastructure, you sell off the current infrastructure and then with the money you fund new infrastructure. And you sell it off to Macquarie Bank because, in fact, what, everything you've just described, even though we're copying the Canadian model, this is really the Macquarie Bank model. Yeah. This is what Macquarie Bank pioneered going back two decades. Um, it's why the, the book about Macquarie Bank uh, and Paul Keating and Super 
said this was the whole purpose of super, create a pool for Macquarie Bank to invest in infrastructure overseas. And now it's writ large. And Joe Hockey spent the last, well, his ambassador to America spruiking Macquarie Bank's model, and now he's working for them. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and they said, you know, that he can now help Macquarie open doors as former ambassador and identify deals and so forth. So it's just completely rotten. Um, but the Canadian pension fund model, I just wanted to talk about a little bit more. Um, PSP Investments, which is a Canadian Crown pension fund, is now one of the largest private owners of water rights in the Murray-Darling Basin. And this, you know, absolutely is not benefiting farmers. In fact, quite the opposite by driving up prices through speculation. You have Ontario Teachers Pension Fund, which last week revealed its bid to purchase Spark Infrastructure Group, which manages electricity infrastructure assets. They've bid for 70% of Optus Telecommunications Towers. Um, they've just acquired a childcare company and, you know, the list goes on. They've also set up an Australian subsidiary um, which has purchased more orchards this year and they made purchases of orchards across the country in previous year, almonds and things like that. Then you've got the Mounties, the Canadian Mounties Fund, <laughs> buying up farmland galore across the country. Um, now, so Australian super funds are beginning to copy that model. Um, BlackRock and Vanguard, these big financial management firms from the United States have swept up a lot of our super investment over the years. Um, and uh, there's government moves to actually allow them to access our supermarket to manage super, superannuation funds even more easily to bypass um, the difficulties of foreign firms obtaining Australian financial service licences. Um, but Australian funds are now saying that they've reached the scale where they can have their own in-house investment teams rather than having to go to these foreign firms um, because there's so much money in Australian super. Um, this is a very, very lucrative field. Now, fortunately, there is, has been a call for an inquiry by Tim Wilson um, into the concentration of share market ownership by firms like BlackRock and Vanguard. Um, but this is a massive um, ball of wax here which has to be unwound. And one of the things we covered a few weeks ago in the alert service is how one aspect of this is that um, uh, these foreign funds, including BlackRock, but also foreign pension funds, have started to uh, extort Australia and say, you need our foreign investment, and I say we don't because we've got plenty of our own money, you need our foreign investment. We won't invest in you unless you take this action, X, Y, Z, on the big issue is climate change, right? You must do this or we won't invest in you. And it's, it's, part, it's, it's extortion um, because we don't need their money in anyway, right? But, it's, but BlackRock actually, it invests other people's money, but it, 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 it takes control of these shares of big corporations and starts dictating what they should do. And it's a big part of the, what you have. This is what a financial dictatorship looks like. Because this, this, this is outside the normal rules of democracy, right? Yeah. Where a, a policy that a government couldn't pass because the public don't want it, a corporation can say our shareholders want it. Oh, your, sh your shareholders, really? Are they the average man and mum and dad in Australia? Hmm. No, they're the biggest, they're, they're this company called BlackRock. Right, and then the then it happens anyway through that means. That's anti-democratic, and this is what a financial dictatorship looks like. Also, Elise, I have to mention this um, because what you described with the with the international flow of our super going over there, their pension funds coming here, it costs the tax office money. Right, they're they're losing out on revenue because of this exemption. Um, that's one area that, that where the, which is costing the tax office money. The total amount of lost revenue for the current just Australian superannuation system because there's tax breaks involved in it is $40 billion. And then on top of that, the, the, all the, the people who manage all the super in, mm. in Australia charge $30 billion in fees to mm. do that, right? That adds up to more than, the, than, than a proper age pension would, would add up to. Yeah, exactly. Right? And the purpose of superannuation when it was introduced... Uh, was not this kind of speculative bubble. Well, let people watch what the purpose was. So if you're, if you're, if you're a young person, you wouldn't have seen this before, but this is um, Bob Hawke in 1990 in the election ad for the 1990 election explaining to Australians what this wonderful new superannuation system would do and pay close attention to this one-minute ad. Because of our new policies, 
Eight out of ten employees already get $15 a week paid into their own personal superannuation scheme by their employer. Now it doubles to $30 a week, saved for your retirement by your boss in schemes that cover ordinary workers and part-time workers for the first time. It's a savings scheme that will be good for you and good for your country. Superannuation is building a massive bank of savings for investment in Australia's export and other productive industries. Every dollar saved helps finance Australia's development without foreign debt. And our superannuation program for all workers means that when you retire, you will do so with dignity of financial security. That's the sensible direction for Australia to take. Authorised by R. Hogg for the Australian Labor Party Canberra. So, uh, what is it? 31 years later, roughly, um, that hasn't come true. Quite we're, the opposite. We're in more foreign debt than ever. It's not funded industry in Australia. Right. I mean, in terms of we don't, we don't have industry anymore for all intents and purposes, a little bit left, etc. It hasn't been the boom that they said it was. And then you've got to look at this, Lisa. Then he says, oh, dignity and retirement. It doesn't even fulfil that. In fact, it's worse. And so here's the question that we'll end on this. Is this system we've got, given that's what they promised and compared to what we've got, where, and, and you know, there's an alarming statistic in Australia where a growing number of people closing in on 50% are retiring without owning their own homes. Mm. So they retire and they're still having to pay off their home or rent. That's terrible because if you're trying to live on a, some kind of pension or superannuation pension and have that huge expense still, mm. it really destroys your living standard. Would we be better with this system or if we didn't have superannuation where instead of that, you, everybody had an adequate age pension, you had your own private savings, you could do what you like with them on the side, go, you know, save hard, do that, do it yourself. But you know you're going to have an age pension and we had it kept the banks under control all these years so we didn't have a property bubble. In other words, you were still, like in the 80s, able to buy a home that was four times your income rather than a home that's 15 times your income you would never pay back. Right? So that people, you know, 90%, 95% of people who retire, retire, own their own home. Wouldn't that be a better system than what we've got? And that's, that answers the question as far as I'm concerned. Yep. Now, on to our next topic, the foreign interference scandal nobody's talking about. Now, this week... Except us today. <laughs> this week in uh, Parliament, Kimberly Kitching, um, the Labor uh, Senator... Senator Introduced a My bill, favourite person. Introduced a bill uh, for Australia to have a one of these Magnitsky Acts, as they're known, um, and it's explicitly modelled on similar bills, as the explanatory memorandum says, from the United States and the United Kingdom. And what this is about is imposing... It would give us, Australia, the power to impose sanctions on... Uh, certain individuals in certain countries that are the targets of Anglo-American foreign policy, uh, i.e. Russia and China, uh, under the pretext of human rights abuses, even though those particular individuals haven't broken any Australian law yep. and there's been no due process involved in those charges against There'll be them. No, you know, they won't need evidence and they won't need due process. So, Lisa, this is one of those more obscure things that happens in Parliament that nobody would ever pay attention to unless we were exposing it, all right? We will put a link, um, as we speak right now, there's a, on YouTube, there's a documentary called The Magnitsky Act Behind the Scenes mm. that's right now available on YouTube. I don't know how long it will be, right? So we'll put a link to our press release that has links in there to that or to where you can actually pay a few dollars, five dollars or something to watch it. Because if you actually want to know about Australian politics, watch this documentary. Because the first point to be made about this bill that she's put up, it's based on an outright lie. The, ma the story of Sergei Magnitsky as told by Bill Browder, who's a con man, an international con man, is an outright lie. But Bill Browder got to come to our parliament and, and, or, or testify to, the, to an inquiry that people like, all the China haters were on this inquiry. Kimberly Kitching, Andrew Hastie, all the, all the little wolverines. Um, as they call themselves, leave their claw marks that we talked about last week, claw marks around Parliament. Um, uh, he, got, he, he got to come and tell this story where he just lies through his teeth and 
you don't have to take my word for it, or even watch this documentary. There are deposition tapes of him on, also on YouTube from a New York deposition he had to give a few years ago where you watch that, that deposition under oath, he contradicts everything he said to the Australian Parliament, right? This is a fraud. This is a guy, Bill Browder is a guy who, he, he works with people who end up dying in unusual ways. <laughs> he worked for um, uh, Robert Maxwell, the guy, the rich British um, uh, media guy who fell off his yacht while Browder was working for him. He worked for Edmund Safra, the banker who burnt down his house while Browder was his, part, was, was his business partner. And now this guy, Sergei Magnitsky, he says, my lawyer who was fighting corruption in Russia, right? No, he wasn't a lawyer. He was an accountant who was involved with Browder in tax evasion schemes. And I interviewed on our show last year, the great, she's a really great um, reporter, Lucy Commissar. She went to a, an event in 2000, long before Browder became a celebrity because this happened in 2009. She went to an event in Moscow in 2000 because she was, she, was, she was an investigative reporter. She was hunting down corruption, mm. the tax evasion system through offshore tax networks, etc. She goes to Moscow. She goes to a, an event hosted by a law firm. And at that law firm, they're handing out a piece of paper promoting the Panamanian law firm Mossack Fonseca. Well, that's what the Panama Papers was about. Mm. And at that meeting, handing out Mossack Fonseca was Bill Browder spruiking his garbage and she gets up and challenges him, right, publicly in front of everybody. And so this woman's been on his case for a while and that's all just swept aside by our parliament. They let him sit there and say, we need this law. And what he's actually doing, he has his own agenda because it, the law allows him, what, when he got it passed in America, um, it was used to sanction a whole bunch of Russian officials, including the Russian tax office officials who were investigating him. <laughs> that was, that's his ulterior motive. However, the reason the Americans passed it, and now the British have passed it and the Canadians have passed it, and if you know Five Eyes, that's three of the Five Eyes, and they said to Australia and New Zealand, you've got to pass this too, oh. right? So we've done it under orders, um, is because this, they can use this to sabotage any chance that the United uh, States and Australia, etc., can hope to repair relations with China and Russia. There are people, it's the military industrial complex, etc., that crowd, um, the neoconservatives, they want a war. You've got to get that in your head. They want war. They don't care who dies, they want war. They have a war economy. They cannot, they, they cannot think outside of those, those terms. And there are people in our country who don't want war, right? He'll say, look, let's, let's, how can we, okay, let's think cleverly. How can we improve our relationship with China, et cetera? And while goodwill, people of goodwill do that, they can come along with this bill and say, oh, that official, we're going to say he's, we're going to make up some ridiculous claim like, um, oh, that he's, he's, he's responsible for genocide against Uyghurs, right? Sanction him. And at a certain point, Russia and China just say, stuff you, mm. right? Just get lost. And, and, it, and that's what this bill is designed to do. But why we're, the, the real scandal here, though, is this. The, our government, the wiser heads in our government, including the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, they uh, expressed reservations about this law. Because they said, look, you're, if we had this law, you would use it to make us sanction China. And we don't really, look, okay, we're happy to call China out, etc. but... We've got, look, we're already, our, our economy is already suffering for this. If you had this law, you would make us do it. And who are they saying that to? They're saying that to Americans and the Brits. You would make us do it. So they were a bit reluctant. So this week, Kimberly Kitchen gets up um, in Parliament and she introduces the bill anyway without the coordination of the Australian government, right? And my question is, who was she do who, on whose behalf was she doing that? Because essentially she was doing that, an Australian Labor senator was doing that on behalf of the US and UK governments to pressure the, to pressure the Australian government. And it worked because the next day, Maurice Payne buckled as the, the, our foreign minister and she said, OK, the Australian government's going to pass this law. That's it. We're in lockstep. We've towed the line. We're in lockstep with the Five Eyes. Mm. Right? That's what happened in Parliament this week. That is foreign interference in front of your eyes. Right? right, the real foreign interference—it's right there. It's not coming from China or Russia. It's right there. We are not—we—we've we, we, lost our statesmanlike leaders of less, yesteryear, like Black Jack McEwen and Malcolm Fraser, who used to stand up to the United States and say, "Hey, we're happy to be your friend and ally, but don't tell us what to do on everything." Right? We will—we will, we will um, uh, 
you know, find an independent course. We've lost all that, right? And when the little times we try, no, nah, they, they manipulate things behind the scenes and suddenly we're towing the line again. And that's what's happened now with this law. And so no one else is going to report this like we are. It's rather obscure, but it's a fundamental exam example of how Australia really works. Mm. And apart from war, as you described, which is the most hor horrendous consequence of this policy direction, um, the other thing that these Anglo-American networks really fear is a, a real economic policy shift. Because if Australia was to cooperate with China, if other countries were to cooperate with China, what they would quickly learn is that China is following an economic policy model which is quite outside of the either free trade directionality, neoliberal directionality, or communism because they did start unwinding communism and going in a new direction. And this is actually called the American system. And I want to point to a, another interview that you did for Citizens Insight, which we've just put out today. We've got a press release out on this called The United States of America, A Blessing or Curse to Mankind. What China's following are the same kind of prescriptions that built the United States and made it the nation that it once was. No, and, and that's true. So I've interviewed this brilliant historian, a friend of ours, um, Tony Chaikin, uh, and he's written this new book called Who We Are. We won't go into all the details. Now look at the press release and look at the... Mm. Go, go, spend, take the time to watch it. He's the one who proposed the title. Um, the, the United States of America, a blessing or curse to mankind, because what he, what, there's, a, there's a reason America's the most dominant country in the world, because it, 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 you know, the, through sheer hard work it became that, through an, an economy that nobody could match, and the pinnacle of that was World War II. But since then, it's just, while we've been in this alliance with it, it's just gone, it's gone crazier and crazier. We just, it's, it's non-stop war, right, repeated and regime change wars. Um, and it's not who America fundamentally is. America's uh, history has never been perfect, but he identifies, you know, there was four great presidents, Washington, Lincoln, Roosevelt, and Kennedy, under whom America made so much advances and that kept going for decades afterwards that, that it became what it is. Um, but now it's a different country. And we have to take stock of that and then say, don't, don't just use it to condemn a country like America. You say, how do we get it back? How are we as Australians, because we, you know, it, it was a valuable alliance, um, how can we use our role to, to um, improve ourselves, improve the United States? And yeah, let's have a world in which, we're, in which we're not trying to mm. start another war, find out grounds, common grounds for cooperation. Exactly, because we need to. We're all facing, the world's facing equal crises across wherever we are. Now, that's the show for this week. Contact us for more information. Don't forget to like and share the video widely. Thanks for joining me, Robbie. Thanks, Elisa. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you again next week. Thank you.